The Beijing 2022 Winter Olympics begin. However, as the opening ceremony kicks off, protests calling for a boycott over human rights in China continue. Also, Russia's President Vladimir Putin meets China's President Xi Jinping in Beijing to discuss closer cooperation amid increasing tensions with the United States. The U.S. State Department says Russia may stage video to create a pretext for Ukraine war. Moscow shuts down German broadcasters' operation in Russia in retaliatory move. Mired in scandal, British Prime Minister Johnson fights to shore up authority. Also in today's program, pro- and anti-abortion protests erupt in Ecuador as lawmakers debate issue. World first as South African lab makes mRNA COVID vaccine using Moderna data. Antarctic fewer eating microbes may help in plastic cleanup. Hello and welcome to FBNC World News. Thanks for joining us here in this Saturday's program. Now, the Beijing Winter Games opened on Friday night in a snow and ice themed ceremony that concluded with the Kautron lit by two young Chinese Olympians, one of them a member of China's Euro minority. Chinese President Xi Jinping on Friday night made the declaration when attending the opening ceremony for the 2022 Winter Olympics at the Burstnet Stadium. Also present at the ceremony were dozens of world leaders and heads of international organizations, including President of the International Olympic Committee Thomas Bach and United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres. The program of the opening ceremony was divided into 15 segments, including the parade of athletes and the lighting of the Olympic flame. As the ceremony started, the lights dimmed and a 24-second countdown followed. The opening day of the Winter Olympics coincides with the first day of the 24 solar terms of the Chinese Lunar New Year namely the beginning of spring, with this concept used to count down the final seconds before the ceremony began. The ground inside the stadium cheered as fireworks exploded overhead and the colorful cultural celebration got underway. The national flag of China passed into the venue by representatives from all walks of life in China. Personnel who made outstanding contributions and representatives of 56 ethnic groups was raised at the opening ceremony to the sound of the national anthem. Now I declare the 24th Olympic Winter Games in Beijing open. As an Olympic tradition, Greece, which hosted the first modern Olympic Games in 1896, was the first team to start the parade of athletes into the national stadium. China, as hosts, marched in last, while future Olympic Winter Games host Italy were the penultimate team to enter under a change approved by the International Olympic Committee Executive Board in December 2019. The rest of the athletes' parade was set according to the complexity of the Chinese characters of their team names, from the ones written with the fewest strokes to the ones with the most. So Turkey was the first to come after Greece. The teams were led by a placard bearer dressed in costumes with ice and snow patterns. The placards in the shape of a glowing snowflake with National Regional Olympic Committee names on them are inspired by the Chinese knot, which is an ancient Chinese craft of hand knitting, symbolizing solidarity and prosperity. Acclaimed Chinese filmmaker Zhang Yimou, who also oversaw the ceremonies at the 2008 Summer Olympics, has once again been made responsible for directing the opening and closing ceremonies of this year's Winter Games. Around 2,900 athletes will compete in 109 events across seven Olympic winter sports disciplines during the course of the Games, which will conclude on February 20th. The Games' motto is Together for a Shared Future, while organizers have also vowed to deliver a simple, safe and splendid Games for the world. 
And as the opening ceremony of the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics kicked off on Friday, criticism over human rights in China continued to mount and activists continued to hold protests. In Turkey, hundreds of protesters from China's Uyghur Muslim ethnic group demonstrated in Istanbul on Friday, calling for a boycott over the Beijing Winter Olympics over China's treatment of their minority. The Beijing Olympics began on Friday, shadowed by a diplomatic boycott over human rights and devoid of most spectators. China stopped the genocide. Muslims don't sleep. Stand up for your brothers. Protesters chanted as they briefly blocked a road and scuffled with lights of Turkish riot police as they tried to march up a hill towards the nearby Chinese consulate. Many of those who gathered on the city's seafront waved the blue and white flags of the independence movement of East Turkestan, a group Beijing says threatens the stability of its far western region of Xinjiang. We hope those taking part in the Olympics, who respect human rights and freedoms, will raise their voices against this, because this is a crime not just against Muslims and the Uyghurs living there but against all humanity. Therefore, we have to stand against this crime together. Chinese authorities have been accused of facilitating forced labor by detaining around a million Uyghurs and other primarily Muslim minorities in camps since 2016. China initially denied the camps existed, but has since said they are vocational centers designed to combat extremism. It denies all accusations of abuse. The United States and many of its allies, including Britain, Canada, Australia, Japan and Denmark, have said they will not send official diplomatic delegations to the Games in protest at China's rights record. UN experts and rights groups estimate more than a million people, mainly from the Uyghur and other Muslim minorities, have been detained in recent years in camps in Xinjiang. Also on Friday, a dozen of human rights activists also gathered in front of China's embassy in Prague to protest against Beijing hosting the 2022 Winter Games. Organizer Veronika Sunova from Human Rights Without Frontier said the protest aimed to highlight the crimes committed by the Chinese Communist Party and the absurdity it is that the Olympic Games are taking place in a country which violates human rights, commits genocide and crimes against humanity. A dozen or so of supporters of Germany's Tibet initiative also held a protest at the German capital's landmark, the Brandenburg Gate, where they held up banners reading, No Genocide Games and No More Bloody Games. Tenzin Zoboer of Tibet Initiative said the German government should have joined other countries like the United States, Britain, Japan and India in boycotting the Games. Also on Friday, Russian President Vladimir Putin arrived in Beijing to attend the 2022 Winter Olympics and held a meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping to discuss closer cooperation amid increasing tensions with the United States. The two presidents attended the opening ceremony of the Winter Olympics in Beijing shortly after they held talks and unveiled a global alliance with an anti-Western tilt in a striking juxtaposition of politics and sport. The new Russian-Chinese alliance was an extraordinary reminder that the games were taking place on a backdrop of geopolitical rivalry unseen since the 1980s, when the United States boycotted games in Moscow and the Soviet Union stayed away from Los Angeles four years later. With geopolitical tensions on both sides of the Eurasian landmass at their most taut for decades, Putin and Xi publicly took each other's sides in a range of disputes, notably Ukraine, where the West accuses Putin of preparing for war. The lengthy joint statement released after their meeting occasionally veered into Cold War-era rhetoric, condemning certain states' attempts to impose their own democratic standards on other countries. In Putin and Xi's joint statement, China backed Russia's long-standing call for NATO to halt its expansion, Moscow's central demand in a dispute with Western countries that say they believe Putin is preparing for war in Ukraine. Moscow, for its part, said it fully supported Beijing's stance on Taiwan and opposed Taiwanese independence in any form. 
Moving on to the war games in Eastern Europe, the presence of a large Russian force in Belarus has added to Western fears that Russia could be preparing to attack Ukraine on multiple fronts. Even though Moscow has repeatedly denied such intention and said the exercises are defensive in nature, it has continued to add tensions as Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoku revealed live fire exercises in Western Belarus on Thursday part of a surge of military activity close to Ukraine. Russia, in its biggest deployment to Belarus since the Cold War ended, is expected to have 30,000 troops as well as fighter jets and missile systems for the joint exercises that run until February 20, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg said. Ukraine said Russia currently has a total of 115,000 troops near its borders. The Russian Ministry of Defense released images from Thursday's exercises showing troops parachuting to the ground, fighter jets in the sky, soldiers dismounting from a helicopter holding weapons, and tanks firing and maneuvering. Shaigu, a close ally of President Vladimir Putin, was pictured looking on with the Belarusian defense minister and other military officials at the Brest military facility in the west of Belarus. The scale of the deployments and drills pointed to the burgeoning alliance between the ex-Soviet neighbors that has accelerated since Moscow helped Belarusian leader Alexander Lukashenko weather huge anti-government protests in 2020. Before the drills took place, Shaigu met Lukashenko and said that Moscow and Minsk would hold a total of 20 joint military maneuvers this year. Russia has not disclosed the number of troops and amount of military hardware it is sending to Belarus. The country of 9.5 million people shares its western border with NATO members Poland, Lithuania and Latvia, while Ukraine lies to its south. Belarus says the exercises are needed due to military buildups in Ukraine, Poland and the Baltic states. President Joe Biden's administration announced on Wednesday the deployment of nearly 3,000 American troops to Eastern Europe in the coming days amid a standoff with Russia over Ukraine, moving to shield NATO allies from potential spillover if war erupts. A U.S. Army plane carrying soldiers and military equipment touched down in Rezzo, Poland, on Friday. The plane had embarked from the Ramstein Air Base in Germany and landed at Rezzo Jason Car Airport, located around 100 kilometers from the Ukraine border. Poland's Foreign Minister Zbigniew Rao will lobby the United States for a proposed U.S. troop increase to remain permanently on a rotational basis, a Polish official said. On Thursday, ahead of Rao's visit to Washington, President Joe Biden's administration announced on Wednesday the deployment of nearly 3,000 American troops to Eastern Europe in the coming days. Around 1,700 of those troops are meant to come to Poland. Poland's Defense Minister Marios Blasak and the Pentagon said on Wednesday, but only temporarily. The U.S. military already has about 4,000 500 troops in Poland in both NATO and a bilateral capacity, mostly stationed in the west of the country on a rotational basis. This military help aims at reinforcing NATO's eastern flank facing a Russian military buildup in Ukraine and Belarus, both neighboring Poland. The U.S. State Department on Thursday said the United States has information that Russia is planning to stage fabricated attacks by Ukrainian military or intelligence forces as a pretext for the invasion of Ukraine, adding that one possible option involves the production of a propaganda video. We have previously noted our strong concerns regarding Russian disinformation and the likelihood that Moscow might create, seek to create, a false flag operation to initiate military activity. Now, we can say that the United States has information that Russia is planning to stage fabricated attacks by Ukrainian military or intelligence forces as a pretext for a further invasion of Ukraine. One possible option the Russians are considering, and which we made public today, involves the production of a propaganda video, a video with graphic scenes of false explosions, depicting cor corpses, crisis actors pretending to be mourners, and images of destroyed locations or military equipment, entirely fabrica fabricated by Russian intelligence. To be clear, the production of this propaganda video is one of a number of options that the Russian government is developing as a fake pretext 
to initiate and potentially justify military aggression against Ukraine. State Department spokesman Ned Bryce told reporters that the United States is publicizing intelligence to lay bare the extent of Russia's destabilizing actions toward Ukraine and to dissuade Russia from continuing what Bryce said was a dangerous campaign. Additionally, Bryce told reporters Secretary of State Antony Blinken and China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi in the last conversation has extended discussion on potential implications of Russian aggression against Ukraine. Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmytro Kuleba told a briefing on Friday that Ukraine was notified by U.S. intelligence about the propaganda video, but Kiev is awaiting more details. Kuleba compared the situation to 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea and backed separatists in eastern Ukraine. U.S. intelligence believes Russia could use a fabricated video showing the graphic aftermath of an explosion, including equipment appearing to belong to Ukraine or allied nations, to justify an incursion. In principle, what was made public does not surprise us, Kuliba said. Since 2014 we have seen a lot of insidious actions by the Russian Federation. Meanwhile, Ukrainian troops on Friday trained at the Yavoriv military base in western Ukraine with anti-tank missiles, launchers and other military hardware delivered by the U.S. as part of a $200 million security package to shore up Ukraine as it braces for a possible Russian military offensive. Washington has said it would continue to support Ukraine amid concerns in Kiev and among its western allies over tens of thousands of Russian troops amassed on its border. Russia denies planning a military offensive. Russia said on Thursday it was shutting down German broadcaster Deutsche Welle's operations in Moscow and stripping its staff of their accreditation in a retaliatory move after Berlin banned Russian broadcaster RTDE. Moscow said it would stop the German channel known as DW being broadcast in Russia and start proceedings that would see it declared a foreign agent, a designation that carries a negative Soviet-era connotation. The Russian Foreign Ministry also said it would bar entry to Russia for German officials involved in the move to ban RTDE. Deutsche Welle's director Peter Lindbergh said the move came as a shock and called the move an absolutely drastic overreaction on the part of the Russian side. But of course we are surprised, and our colleagues in Moscow are also shocked, because this is an absolutely drastic overreaction on the part of the Russian side. And we very much hope that we can still change the situation there by legal means. We can't say whether we will succeed or not. Of course we will continue our reporting on Russia and if necessary even intensify it. Because it is very important that the Russian population also hears Deutsche Welle's point of view and can continue to get their news. So far there has only been a statement from the Russian Foreign Ministry. No formal notification has been made yet, and we now have to wait and see how this will be implemented in concrete terms. In any case, we will continue to broadcast as long as we haven't received a formal request to leave the country. Germany's foreign ministry said in a statement that Moscow's measures had no basis whatsoever and represent a renewed strain on German-Russian relations. Germany's MABB media watchdog and Commission for Licensing and Supervision of Media Institutions said this week that RTDE could not broadcast in Germany using a Serbian license, a decision that angered Russia. In a statement on its website detailing its retaliatory measures, Russia's foreign ministry described the German move as unfriendly. The role comes amid wider tensions with the West over Ukraine that are an early test of political relations between Berlin and Moscow after German Chancellor Olaf Scholz took office in December. State-funded Deutsche Welle said it had formally protested against the move. We really were very surprised, because these measures are absolutely excessive and they are certainly at the upper end of the scale of what could have been done. And it is unjustified, because we are also not comparable with RT Deutsch RT German. We are a public service broadcaster not controlled by the state, which you really can't say about RT. In this respect, we are actually more than disappointed that such a drastic measure has been taken. 
The announcement on DW comes amid a crackdown on media outlets that Russia considers foreign agents. It uses a term to designate foreign-funded organizations it says are engaged in political activity. You're watching SBC World News. Sergio Mattarella urged Italians to pull together to support the country's recovery from the coronavirus pandemic after he was sworn in for a second term as Italy's president on Thursday. The reappointment of Mattarella, who had initially been reluctant to sign up for a second seven-year term, brought some temporary respite to tensions within Italy's broad, ruling coalition after a week of fruitless efforts to find a successor. We still need to work together to strengthen Italy, beyond the current difficulties. A fairer, more modern Italy, intensely linked to the friendly peoples around us. Mattarella said he had not shirked the responsibility of accepting a second term because of the coronavirus crisis and Italy's difficult economic and social conditions. Italy has recorded more than 147,000 deaths linked to COVID-19, the second highest tally in Europe after Britain. And the economy is still recovering from the shock dealt to businesses by repeated lockdowns and restrictions. Political tensions are expected to rise in Prime Minister Mario Draghi's broad, unity coalition as parties jockey for position ahead of a national election due early next year. The president also referred to the situation in Ukraine, where Russian troops have massed on the border, and called for a peaceful solution to the crisis. For many decades, European countries have been able to enjoy peace, made concrete by European integration, and increased by the end of the Cold War. We cannot accept that now, without even the pretext of competition between different political and economic systems, the winds of confrontation are once again blowing across a continent that has experienced the tragedies of the First and Second World Wars. We must call on our own resources and those of our allies and friends, so that displays of strength give way to mutual understanding, so that no people has to fear aggression from its neighbors. Mattarella, who is from Sicily and is a former government minister, has won the respect of Italians with his quiet, unassuming manner and calm handling of repeated political crises and the health emergency. In Italy's political system, the president is a powerful figure who gets to appoint prime ministers and is often called on to resolve political crises. Governments in the Eurozone's third largest economy survive around a year on average. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson was fighting on Friday to shore up his authority after a senior aide resigned over his false claim that the leader of the opposition Labour Party failed to prosecute a notorious child sex abuser. Johnson, who in 2019 won the biggest conservative majority since Margaret Thatcher, has repeatedly refused to resign over revelations that he and some of his staff attended Downing Street parties during COVID lockdowns. Those revelations raised questions about Johnson's often chaotic style of leadership and have led to the greatest threat to him since he took office. They follow a series of other scandals. Johnson admitted that problems needed to be fixed at the heart of Downing Street, which serves as both his home and the nerve center of the British state. Minira Mirza, his head of policy who had worked with him for 14 years, resigned on Thursday over Johnson's claim that Labour leader Keir Starmer failed to prosecute pedophile Jimmy Saville during his time as Director of Public Prosecutions. Starmer had cast Johnson's command as a ridiculous slur and conspiracy theory that shows Johnson is unfit to be British leader. Ministers presented three additional resignations which followed Mirza as evidence that Johnson was fixing the problems at Downing Street and taking charge, though there remained considerable anger at Johnson within his own party. A member of Johnson's policy unit also quit on Friday. While opposition parties and some of Johnson's own lawmakers have called on him to quit, there is concern that toppling a British leader at this juncture would leave the West weakened as it faces a potential military crisis in Ukraine. With inflation soaring at the fastest rate in 30 years, anger at the government is likely to deepen ahead of the May local election. 
Leading rivals within the Conservative Party include Chancellor of the Exec Sunak, 41, and Foreign Secretary Lee Strauss, 46. To trigger a leadership challenge, 54 of the 360 Conservative MPs in Parliament must write letters of no confidence to the chairman of the party's 1922 committee. Anti-abortion protesters and groups in favor of legalized abortion protested outside Ecuador's National Assembly on Thursday as lawmakers held a debate on a law that could allow abortion in cases of rape. While protesters in favor of a new abortion law said they hope for a dignified life of women and girls and the possibility of a safe abortion, anti-abortion protesters said that life begins with fertilization and that a gram cannot cover up another gram. A move to legalize abortion was introduced to lawmakers in June 2021 following a constitutional court ruling that decriminalized abortion in rape cases. The court decision included provisions for the country's legislative assembly to set the legal parameters for abortion to take place. Lawmakers are debating whether to allow rape victims and minors to have access to an abortion up to 22 weeks into the pregnancy. Before the ruling of the Constitutional Court, abortion in the conservative Catholic country was deemed illegal except in the case of a threat to the life of health of a pregnant woman. And more advancement has been made in the area of COVID-19 vaccines. South African African Biologics had used the publicly available sequence of Moderna's COVID-19 mRNA vaccine to make its own version of the shot, which could be tested in humans before the end of this year, the company's top executive said on Thursday. The vaccine candidate would be the first to be made based on a widely used vaccine without the assistance and approval of the developer. It is also the first mRNA vaccine designed, developed and produced at lab scale on the African continent. The World Health Organization last year picked a consortium, including Afrigen, for a pilot project to give poor and middle-income countries the know-how to make COVID-19 vaccines, after market leaders of the mRNA COVID vaccine, Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna declined a WHO request to share their technology and expertise. The WHO and partners hope the hub will help overcome glaring inequalities between rich nations and poorer countries in accessing vaccine doses, with 99% of all of Africa's vaccines imported and the negligible remainder manufactured locally. During the pandemic, wealthy countries have hoovered up most of the world's supplies of vaccines. BioVac, a partly state-owned South African vaccine producer, will be the first recipient of the technology from the hub. Afrigen has also agreed to help train companies in Argentina and Brazil. In September, the WHO hub in Cape Town decided to go it alone after failing to bring on board Pfizer and Moderna, both of which have argued they need to oversee any technology transfer due to the complexity of the manufacturing process. Moderna's vaccine was chosen due to an abundance of public information and its pledge not to enforce patents during the pandemic. It's not clear what will happen after that. The UN-backed medicines patent pool, MPP, said it was in talks with Moderna about possible access to some of its patents under pressure to make drugs in lower-income countries. Moderna and BioNTech have announced plans to build mRNA vaccine factories in Africa, but production is still a long way off. BioVac has agreed to fill and finish the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, the final stages of production, although the drug substance will come from Europe. Speaking to media and delegates at the launch, Petro Turblanche, managing director at Afrigen, said the company did not copy Moderna. They instead developed their own processes because Moderna didn't give any technology. She also said it had managed to make, in collaboration with Johannesburg's University of the Witwatersrand, its first microliter laboratory scale batches of COVID-19 mRNA vaccines at the Cape Town facility. Turblanche added that they are working on a next-generation mRNA vaccine that didn't need freezing temperatures for storage required for the Pfizer and Moderna doses, and which would be better suited to the hot conditions of Africa with its poorer health facilities and infrastructure. 
A team of Argentine scientists is using microorganisms native to Antarctica to clean up pollution from fuels and potentially plastics in the pristine expanses of the White Continent. Munch through the waste, creating a naturally occurring cleaning system for pollution caused by diesel that is used as a source of electricity and heat for research bases in the frozen Antarctic. The continent is protected by a 1961 Maldrid Protocol that stipulates it must be kept in a pristine state. The research on how the microbes could help with plastic waste could have potential for wider environmental issues. This work uses the potential of native microorganisms, bacteria and fungi that inhabit the Antarctic soil even when it is contaminated, and makes these microorganisms eat the hydrocarbons. What for us is a contaminant, for them can be food. We optimize the conditions to do so, add nitrogen, phosphorus, let it ventilate and correct some of the humidity conditions. Basically with that we get the microorganisms to biologically reduce, with a very low environmental impact, the level of contaminants. Rubado traveled in December with other researchers to Colony, one of the six permanent Argentine bases in Antarctica, going through a quarantine to help avoid bringing COVID-19 to the continent, where there have been isolated virus breakouts. The team carried out bioremediation tasks, which involve cleaning soil affected by diesel, using indigenous microorganisms and plants, a process that can be used in the austral summer and removed some 60 to 80 percent of contaminants. The team has now started to research how the microbes could help clean up plastic waste elsewhere. Both fuels and plastics are polymers, molecules made up along chains of mainly carbon and hydrogen. This year we incorporated as one of the group's projects the search for indigenous microorganisms that are capable of degrading plastic. If we find that it is indeed degrading plastic, the next step would be to understand how it does that, so that in the long term we could find a way to put together a biotechnology process for low-temperature polymer degradation. Jubodo said doing their work within the awe-inspiring surrounds of the Antarctic helped motivate the research. Being able to investigate in Antarctica is a dream come true, he said. It is a unique protected place with very special ecosystems. And that has wrapped up our program today. Thank you for watching. Until next time, goodbye.